Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, with more housing predictions for you today. Also, where have we actually gone with all investment types lately? Then learn why build to rent housing is both here to stay and continues to be one of the most attractive niches in all of real estate today. We're talking about how renters will prefer to live for the next decade, all today on Get Rich Education. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans, and they finance single-family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 328. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. This year, I think that housing prices are going to continue to rise, but not as much as they did last year when they rose 11%. That is because at some point, there will be an affordability constraint, but I still expect prices to rise nonetheless. This is primarily due to the increases in employment that we're going to have with an expected economic recovery. I just don't see it being as high as 11% again. What do I think is going to happen down the road in 2023, 2024, or 2025? Well, that gets really difficult to predict, but I think that you can learn something from this here. When interest rates rise, whenever that is, and no economist that I've talked to expects interest rates to rise anytime soon, but do you know what happens to housing supply then? Do you think that rising interest rates correspond with greater housing supply or less supply? Which one? Any idea? Do higher rates mean greater supply or lesser supply? The answer is, with rising interest rates, supply falls. In order to understand why, let me just ask you, if you own a home and you've got a 3% interest rate on it, and then interest rates rise up to 5%, well, how likely are you to move into a new home? See, not very likely, because when you sell the home that you're already in, you're going to lose that favorable interest rate and would have to go then and pay a higher interest rate. So in a rising rate environment, this is why fewer people want to sell their property and why you'll be less likely to want to sell yours, whether that's your rental or your primary residence. That means that no one is then putting supply on the market. Well, that limited supply means that prices stay buoyant. Understand that even with lower and lower interest rates, like we've had the past two or more years, supply is already low. So when interest rates inevitably rise, even if that doesn't happen until 2023 or 2025, yes, that is just another reason that supply should stay low, which supports house prices in future years. Just amazing when you think about it. So that is why higher interest rates limit housing supply, which further supports prices. That's the future, and we never know the future. People put an outsized importance on future speculation. So let's look at the numbers and what really happened last year with our asset class whip around. Real estate was up 11%, as I mentioned, and that is per the Freddie Mac housing price index. And by the way, that's only a November to November number as that figure lags. Everything else here is for the full calendar year last year. Interest rates began last year at 3.72%, which was already astoundingly low. And then astonishingly, they fell more than 1% just last year alone, down to 2.67%. Of course, that's a 30-year owner-occupied rate. Inflation began last year at 2.5%. With the lack of demand that we've had in the economy, it fell, so it ended last year at 1.4%. And this is per the government-reported 
Consumer Price Index, which you can always check at bls.gov. In stocks, the S&P 500 was up 16% last year to a level of about 37.50. The dollar weakened. Bitcoin surged over 400% up to 29K by the end of last year, and it's risen even more in the first few weeks of this year. Gold, any idea what happened there? It was up 25% to over 1900 bucks, And more quietly, silver was up 48%. In fact, both silver and gold had their best years since 2010. Oil was down 21% to 48 bucks because it was pandemically slowed. That is the asset class whip around. Back to the future here. Coming up on the show in future weeks, Ken McElroy and I will be talking about real estate investing here on the show together. Ken has been one of the most recurrent guests in Get Rich Education history. I was just with Ken at his office in Scottsdale, Arizona a couple weeks ago. We toured around the office. He showed me some of his awards, like the Best Places to Work Award. And we shot some videos together there in his studio, which you'll soon see on our Get Rich Education YouTube channel. Hopefully you're checking out our Get Rich Education YouTube channel from time to time. But expect Ken and I here on the Get Rich Education podcast soon. Also from masterclass.com, Chris Voss and I will be here talking about negotiation. Chris might very well be the best known negotiator in all of America. He's the author of Never Split the Difference. Of course, negotiation is such an important element of real estate investing. Many say that you make five to seven negotiations every single day, even if it's as simple as whether it's you or your spouse that are going to be folding the laundry tonight. Here's a slice of our upcoming guest, Chris Voss. I'm going to tell you about the F word, fair, the F bomb. Fair comes up in nearly every single negotiation. As soon as you look for the word fair and aware of how much it comes up, rarely does it not come up. People use it to manipulate other people. People use it when they're backed into a corner. The concept of fairness is fundamental to what we are as human beings, and that's why it comes up all the time. So how do you use the F-bomb positively? How do I use it? At the beginning of a negotiation, I want you to say the other side, it's my intention to treat you fairly. If at any point in time I've been unfair, let me know. We'll go back and address it and fix it. Be proactive, put yourself in a position where they'll deal with the problem because otherwise, if they feel they've been treated unfairly, it's going to explode on you. Yes, Chris will be here with us soon, and you won't even have to pay any masterclass tuition for that. Today, I've got an extraordinary show for you, a really special builder in the build to rent residential niche. So we're talking about new construction properties here. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about somewhat pricier fourplexes here on the show. Today, it's more approachable price points for you. In fact, I'm going to ask today's guest about how he can build so affordably single-family homes as low as $169,000. And these are in suburban areas where renters really want to lease these homes from you that you can own as an investment yourself. So if you're in position and you're pre-qualified with, say, a Ridge Lending Group or whomever your mortgage company is, you're really going to like this. People don't want to so much live in a small apartment downtown today. That is because a big reason for living in a small downtown apartment are for those things that are often shut down today, like clubs and shows and a nice dinner. Sports are often shut down. So are public swimming pools and just a lot of those amenities that made downtown living attractive in the first place. So downtown has lost its luster, and civil unrest has added yet another layer for people wanting to avoid downtown apartment living. Another reason for that is oftentimes you wanted to be close to your job. Well, that's become less important with remote work, as we know. Now, I think that downtowns could very well make a comeback, but it's going to take some time Instead, often for a similar price, renters can get an entire house in the suburbs with a whole lot of rooms in it. And a whole lot of rooms really matters now that people live at home and work at home and work out at home and might even teach their kids and homeschool. Though we'll talk about these new construction single-family homes mostly, the interesting thing to tell you is that they also offer 
duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes in addition to those single families. And they all provide a rental yield for an individual investor like you. In fact, they're going to build about 1,100 homes this year. So I'm really excited to bring you this. Prices are up all over the place, but here today we're talking about rent to price ratios of nearly eight tenths of 1%. And there really are a number of reasons that make that figure, eight tenths of 1%, even sweeter for you, like today's low interest rates. The fact that new build products can have mega low property insurance rates, new build, of course, has those lower maintenance costs. And then new build, if you're so inclined, what that does is it even gives you a more viable option to self-manage it remotely because so few things can go wrong with an all-new property. And self-management, that can save you $100 up to maybe $150 in monthly cash flow per property, depending on how you value your time. Let's discuss why build to rent residential might be the most attractive niche in all of real estate today. Chris Funk has long had an entrepreneurial spirit. While still in college, he began a laundry and dry cleaning business that grew into an industry leader in Northeast Florida. Later, he developed a residential real estate business that's become a leader today, including running a highly successful property management company. He and his wife are also avid equestrians. Welcome out of the show, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Chris, build to rent, that's a phrase that contractors and builders used to think of as applying to apartment buildings, where you're going to build a structure that's not occupied by owners, but rather occupied by tenants. And then somewhere along the line, some years ago, people thought, now what if we build single family homes brand new? and then put them all next to each other. And then we still have these construction and management efficiencies. We can do things like use the same appliances in all of them and make build to rent single family homes. That's been an industry trend. Tell us about what you do in the build to rent single family home space, Chris. It's important to note how we got to where we are today. And we started out after the 2008 crash buying foreclosed homes at the foreclosure auction. As those properties continued to get more and more expensive as time went on and as the market recovered, it became apparent that the properties that we were buying, we were buying them at a much higher price per square foot, but they were still older properties. They still had the same expense ratios that came with an old property. However, the price had just gone up significantly. So that was really what gave us the thought to go into build to rent. It was really to eliminate as much of the maintenance expense that we could out of our portfolio. As we all know, maintenance in turn is what's going to kill your yield. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time looking and designing plans that would work both very well for our tenants, but very well for our, the profitability of our portfolio. To do that, we really had to take a look at, at every expense item that we spent on our existing portfolio and anything that stuck out. Those were the items that we resolved most readily. And. I'll get into a few of those, but back in the day, we were buying these older homes with uh, the T111 siding. Well, that was just horrendous from a WDO standpoint, wood-destroying organisms. Every time that we would go look at one of those properties, they just looked like they were deteriorating. And or if we went to sell them, there were all the repairs that had to be done. It was terribly difficult to keep the outside of those properties looking right and also passing inspections. When we started the build to rent, we decided that everything on the exterior of our properties were going to be cement. So whether that was a cement hardy board, if we were building a frame house, or if it was stucco over block, if we're building a block house. And the reason that we build different types of product is really the different areas because we build from Atlanta all the way down to Southwest Florida and certain areas are stick built homes and certain areas are block homes. With that, we found that these homes are just a lot more durable they look a lot better from a long-term hold standpoint. They're just a lot more durable. We took the same approach on the inside. When we would do a turnover on one of our homes, inevitably, the carpet was always a problem. Even if it looked okay, maybe it smelled bad or vice or both. You know, it looked bad and it smelled bad. We were either having to replace carpet essentially every turn or we were having to clean it. It wasn't quite right or it didn't smell quite right, which meant that we weren't, you know, achieving the highest possible rent because that's something that the tenants were looking at and coming in and, and uh, not being pleased with. 
So you're paying for it one way or the other. So to resolve that issue, we put vinyl plank floors through every room in our home. They look fantastic. They're a faux wood floor. So it looks like a hardwood floor, but it's more durable than a hardwood floor. And that, in addition to our granite countertops, because that was the other thing that we saw, was that the tenants would not use cutting boards and the laminate countertops would just get destroyed. Those are some of the, the highlights of what we able to achieve just right out of the gate in savings on our turnover, which obviously leads to the long-term profitability of the portfolio. That example with the cutting boards and the countertops really speaks a lot to building with a renter in mind from the beginning and having those durable finishes. But we pull back and we look at bigger trends, macro trends. You talked about how you would often buy foreclosed properties coming out of the global financial crisis. We're looking at 12 years ago. That's when the industry was oversupplied with homes. And often back then, you could purchase a home for less than the replacement cost because there was such a glut of supply. But now we're in a condition 180 degrees different from that, where there's a real dearth of supply. And with this low supply, the way to keep your chronically low supply is to go ahead and build new and give the industry what they want. And part of building new single family rental communities is that we have this less dense living environment. Now, this was an attractive thing for people to get into even before the pandemic. But of course, the pandemic has just exacerbated this trend toward greater desirability for single family rental homes. A lot of times people talk about social distancing. We can think of that as residential distancing. Absolutely. It's bad to say or hurts me to say, but the COVID for Florida and Georgia real estate has really been good for the real estate market down here. And I say that because, you know, you have a lot of folks that are moving out of these very densely populated areas up north. You have a lot of folks that aren't having to report to offices anymore. And so where do they want to go? You know, they want to go south, Florida, Texas, Arizona. These are all areas that are picking up a lot of this population that is fleeing either densely populated areas or colder environments. And so we've really been the beneficiary of that. Florida in general, even pre-COVID, and same with Atlanta, which is another one of our big markets, those were growth markets. Those are the whole reasons that we build where we build is because they were growing at a rapid pace pre-COVID. Post-COVID, that's just been accelerated. And the home builders have seen the exact same issue. And that leads back to the supply issue that you've seen. I I shouldn't call it an issue. It's a great thing for our market, but it has created a lot issue for national home builders. They're scurrying out there to get as many lots as they can. And it's also very interesting to understand where we came from. So we've had a 12 years since the financial crisis. And during that time period, we've seen upwards of 10% or more growth in Florida in general, in some markets significantly more than that. Jacksonville market being a market that's a significantly higher growth rate than the overall Florida market. You take the five county area around Jacksonville, we're on track as a whole, all the builders in this market to pull about 12,000 permits this year. If you put that into perspective, in 2005, when the crash began, there were 18,000 permits pulled in that time period. There's a significantly more permits were pulled in 2005 than have been pulled in 2020. And population has gone up probably you know, well over 10% in this market during that time period. It's not for lack of demand. The demand is absolutely through the roof. It's for lack of lot supply. And lot supply is what's really holding back the amount of permits being pulled in the market today, which for us is really a great thing. It adds that scarcity level to both renters and home buyers, you know, people that are looking to buy the properties to live in them. Yeah, scarcity is a good word in today's single family market. And we think about things like that end tenant that we're serving. We think about their employment and we also think about their household income. Oftentimes we know that in the pandemic, those single family tenants have tended to do really well in even in an area of eviction moratoriums. They have been the proportion that's been able to pay the rent. Apartments have done even better than what people think as well, but that occupancy rate and that rate which they're actually paying the rent has really been high, even in light of eviction moratorium. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that anyone that would rent a 
single family new construction home, in general, they're going to tend to have a higher income. In fact, the two biggest landlords in the United States, Invitation Homes and American Homes for Rent, they rent out about 130,000 homes between them. Their average tenant makes more than $100,000 a year. So my point is that end tenant that we're serving, oftentimes they have the ability to be a homeowner, but they don't necessarily want to be a homeowner. That's who we're serving here. You're 100% correct. Since the 2008 crash, there's been a, a real shift uh, away from home ownership. You know, right. a lot of folks are choosing to rent. They like the ability to be able to move around, try different areas, not be tied down. And it's similar to the fact that even some of the home buyers in these markets are opting for smaller homes than they used to. You know, you don't see nearly as many three, four, five thousand square foot houses being built. Uh, you see a lot more 2,000 and below square foot houses being built, even for the homeowners. There's been a real shift in people's psyche as to how they want to be able to live their life and as that relates to their home. Talk more about how you're serving that single family build to rent niche in both Florida and Georgia. It's keeping in mind those amenities that tenants desire. For example, today, a tenant really values having a yard, even if it's a small yard, but oftentimes a renter puts less value on having a fireplace inside a unit, for example. Absolutely. The yard's a big one, of course, um, but also we find that that our folks like the fact that they've got a home, a single family home, and it's really in areas that we pick that we want to be in. So when we go and we pick an area that we want to build in, we're picking it because of the demographics, because of the school districts, because of the income. We're not having to go find existing products. A lot of times we're developing the land. So we're going out, we're finding an area that we want to be in. We're putting in the roads and the sewer and the water and the electric and then we're building homes on those lots that we developed that used to be a field and used to be a forest. We're not stuck with having to go to areas just because that's where there's affordable housing to buy. We come in and we build the affordable housing. We're much different than a, than a national home builder in that, that we look at ourselves as a wholesale builder. We're looking at making sure that when we build something that it's going to achieve a rental yield for the client of ours that's buying it. Whereas a home builder is just looking to achieve as much margin as they can. Right. And in this market, they're maximizing that margin because they have very few lots. But we don't take that approach. We're in this for the long run, which is, you know, we want to manage the property for our clients long term and we want them to come back and buy more and more properties from us. Unlike retail home sales, retail home sales, you sell a house to somebody once, you're probably not going to sell them another house for 20 years. You know, our clients come back two, three, four times a year sometimes as they want to grow their rental portfolio. From the tenant perspective, they don't see that side of the business. That's what the landlord sees. The, the tenant sees, hey, that's a house in an area that I want to be. And that's because we developed a lot there. And so for all of those same reasons, the tenants flock to that single family home. In addition to the fact, all the things that I mentioned earlier about the granite countertops and the vinyl plank floors, not only are they durable from a replacement and repair standpoint, they're also very aesthetically pleasing for the tenants. When a tenant is making a decision, do I want to buy a home or do I want to rent a home? Well, a lot of times, you know, you'll take like a DR Horton Express home. Those are going to be carpeted throughout. They're going to be laminate countertops above mount sinks. When they walk into one of our homes and they're up in the air as to whether to buy or rent and they've got faux wood floor all the way throughout, they've got granite countertops with under mount sinks, stainless steel appliances. Some home builders don't even put appliances in. They have to buy appliances after the fact. So they start weighing out all of these options in their mind. And then at the end of the day, one just looks prettier than the other. And so if they're on the fence, they're going to go towards the pretty one. And so in this case, you know, we try to make all the advantages for our landlords to add profitability to their portfolio, the same things that are aesthetically pleasing to those tenants. That's one of the biggest compliments that we get from our tenants is just how the product looks and that they actually have a pride of ownership in that product. Then you get back to the lack of density. We're not in an apartment complex where people are stacked on top of each other, you know, four stories high, side by side by side, all using the same staircase. That's been an additional boost to the rural areas that we build in. We build in Jacksonville, Florida, which is dense, but not nearly as dense as a New York City or in an Atlanta for that fact. But we also build in Ocala and some of the outskirt cities around Ocala, Inverness, Citrus Springs, Homosassa, 
And you look these up on a map and you say, well, man, it's not right next door to a big metropolitan area like Jacksonville, but there's tons of jobs out there. You have a lot of these warehousing facilities, still a lot of agricultural work, a lot of service workers, and these folks make money. They make plenty of money. And these are markets where where we can still buy land at reasonable prices and the impact fees are lower that the municipalities are charging. So we're able to bring the total cost of the home down to match what those tenants are able to afford in the rent of that area. So they can be exactly where they want to be with exactly the home that they want and really check all those boxes for them. That's what we're seeing from a tenant standpoint. Oh, you bring up so many good points there, Chris. We call it build to rent, but build to rent is best done when it's got those built to last features inside the home like you're bringing up. And no wonder you've had so much repeat business. That's a big reason why I have you here with me now. That's a great testimony to what you're doing there in desirable locations to live. That has changed somewhat within these pandemic reverberations with more people working from home, for example, that puts less premium on living close to the urban core like you're touching on. Well, Chris is going to tell us more about how in the heck he makes these things affordable. I think it's often understood in the industry that builders can really only make money selling at a price point of, say, 500 k or more, depending on the market. But that's not what they're doing here. They're affordable so that the rent to purchase price ratios work for you as an investor. You're listening to Get Rich Education. We're talking about build to rent single family homes. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Congress just made it possible to get up to $100,000 out of your current 401k or TSP to invest in real estate, gold, or even your own business. That's even if you're still working and avoid the IRA UBIT tax. The thing is, you can get your money tax and penalty free for a limited time. The EQRP is your secret weapon. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the EQRP company helps you unleash your retirement funds now. Learn more and text message EQRP in all capital letters to 72000 most rental property investors choose either cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market can give you both Jacksonville, Florida, with 27% lower home prices than the national median, 1% higher gross rents, and Jacksonville has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets over the last 30 years. Get positive cash flow today and appreciation for tomorrow. To invest for cash flow and growth in Jacksonville, go to cashflowandgrowth.com. This is Entrepreneur on Fire's John Lee Dumas. Don't follow money. Make money follow you with Get Rich Education. You're listening to the show that's created more financial freedom for busy people just like you than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. We're talking about the build to rent single family home space here, Chris and I. This is potentially an actionable episode for you where they build for investors like you in mind so that you can get cash flow and hopefully long-term appreciation. And Chris, I know that you offer a new construction product for as low as $169,000, which is got to make some people remark, how in the heck do you do that today? First of all, we've got a great purchasing team. We'll build about 1,100 homes this year. And uh, we are able to achieve a lot of the economies of scale of some of the national home builders out there. Additionally, we're building on two different types of lots. Some are lots that we're developing, meaning that we're putting in all the sewer infrastructure roads, which means we're cutting out the developer, which is the middleman. When a developer is developing lots, they're having to mark that lot up to sell it to a home builder. Well, when we act as both, we cut out that middleman. So we're able to shave down costs there. Alternatively, we're still able to buy some infill lots throughout the state of Florida. And infill means that there's an existing neighborhood and we go buy a lot here and a lot there and build on those. And the reason that we're able to do that, as opposed to like a lot of the, the big national home builders is we're able to just be more nimble. That's not something they want to do. They want to go build 100 houses in a row, which keeps those lot prices affordable for us so that we can pass that savings on to our clients. So really a lot comes down to the land acquisition and or development savings that we achieve up front. In addition to the cost that we're able to drive down just through our purchasing power of how many homes that we've built. A lot of our clients you know, come from New York, California, Colorado, 
where there's huge impact fees. You know, we think our impact fees are big in Florida, but they're nothing compared to the impact fees <laughs> um, of some of these other states. We don't have that added layer of cost that you see in these other areas. You know, so it's a combination of those factors that's able to keep the overall cost structure down. And then the fact that we're looking for a customer for life, we're not looking for a customer to make the maximum amount of margin from on each time. So we operate off a very thin margin so that our investors can create that rental yield that they're looking for. Because at the end of the day, our management company is the management that is is what's going to have to get that yield for those clients long term. So we want to make sure that everybody's happy. And we know if we sell a product that can't get a rental yield, that sooner or later, we're going to have to have that conversation with a client. So this is what our business is. We don't sell homes to retail home buyers. We are investors ourselves. So we invest in every one of our communities and we build for that rental yield. And that's how we achieve those numbers. It's about engineering that property from a value perspective so that it makes sense for that investor or for that landlord. And when you are building new and you're not only doing resale 1977 homes and you can be nimble, that term that you introduced being nimble, that way you can build to the features that today's tenants really want. Tell us more about the rent range and the price range on your homes. And then is it always single family homes? No. So we build a combination of single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes, and townhomes. And so the prices range, you know, obviously depending on product type, but our single family homes are typically between that $169,000 price point up to about 225, 230. Occasionally, if we get an infill lot in a much higher end neighborhood where the rents are higher, we're typically paying a little bit more for that lot. So the price goes up. But as a general rule of thumb, they stay between 169 and 230. And then from a duplex, triplex, quadruplex, we have duplex uh, models that are as low as $295,000 right now. So less than $150,000 a unit. And then those go up to, you know, as much as 350, depending on the unit type and, and where it's located. Same with our quadruplexes. So, you know, we have quadruplexes as low as uh, 480000 and as high as $600,000. But you can see quadruplex, $600,000, even at the high end of our, our numbers, that's still only $150,000 per unit. Across the board, our average price per unit last year was $154,000. That's super it's competitive. Super, super competitive. And we're able to hit multiple different price points as well because of the different models that we build. So we build two bedroom units, we build three bedroom units, we build four bedroom units. Some of the less easy to see aspects relate to insurance. Insurance companies love to insure this type of property because they're built to current codes and standards. That really gets you a huge discount on your insurance policy. That's something that's been over and over just shocked me, you know, because when we were doing our turnkeys, it was double our current cost on our uh, new construction homes. Those are a couple of the big factors there that achieve a lot more savings. Give us an idea on a new construction $200,000 single family home, what would the rent income be? And of course, that's going to vary because you do operate in a few Florida geographies and in Georgia geographies. Right. So, you know, if you take a, a $200,000 home and $1,575 a month, give or take. Okay. So about eight tenths of 1% on what one might call the rent to value ratio. And then typically as you go into duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, that ratio becomes even more favorable. And of course, we need to remember we're talking about new construction, single family homes here. The things that temper that rent to value ratio are the fact that we have lower interest rates than we've ever had before. Chris, you touched on the new build, low insurance rates, the new build, low maintenance and the new build quality of tenant that you're going to have oftentimes that is less harsh and treats that unit somewhat better. I know you also have management under the same roof as your property provider company there. So it really is turnkey and sort of all in one for an investor. Well, this has been great information, Chris. Why don't you let our audience know what inventory that you have available now? We have inventory right now in Ocala and Inverness. Southwest Florida, which is Cape Coral, Port Charlotte, Puna Gorda, as well as Palm Coast. And I think I mentioned Fort Myers, but if I didn't, uh, Fort Myers as well. We have a couple units left in Atlanta in a townhome community that we're just finishing up up there. We're always re-upping our inventory. Anybody that has an interest, you know, certainly reach out. 
we'd be happy to tell you what we have at that given time. And and that does change on a regular basis. We have seven full-time acquisition folks that are out there buying lots and land for us every day. So for those that think you can't find inventory, you can't find options, or at least you can't find ones that are affordable, here is potentially an option for you. If this sounds of interest to you, Chris put together a report for you that tells you more about the geographies that they operate in, the product, the sort of tenants, and the demographics in the area. You can learn more at getricheducation.com slash Southeast, since he operates in a few different geographies in the Southeastern United States. And that way you can connect with the provider as well. That's getrichseducation.com slash Southeast. Chris, do you have any last things that you'd like to tell a prospective investor here in the year 2021, especially when it comes to build to rent residential property that's new construction? I can just tell them what I'm doing with my personal portfolio, which is I'm locking in as many of these low rates as we can possibly lock in at this point in time. With everything that's going on out there in the world today, you know, the risk of inflation is certainly looming. And there's nothing better than real estate, particularly when you have a very low fixed interest rate to hedge against uh, that inflationary risk. Inflation actually becomes your friend at that point in time if you own real assets. I've talked about that so much on the show lately. Debt can really be good in two different instances. Number one, when your interest rate is lower than the rate of inflation, your debt is being debased even faster than interest accrues. And the other instance is when your tenant pays your debt for you. But with what we're talking about here, you're actually doing that both ways at the same time. So thanks so much for sharing your insight today, Chris. If you want to learn more, check out getricheducation.com slash Southeast. Chris, it's been a great chat. Thanks so much for coming onto the show. Thanks for having me, Keith. I really appreciate it. Well, just a terrific overview on why build to rent is such a compelling part of real estate today. Besides making a lot of sense operationally, it caters to the demographic and lifestyle trends that could very well be in place for the next decade. And it's in those geographies that make a lot of sense too. Veteran investors are buying these one to four unit properties because I'm one of them. These really cater to beginners though. It's not just the lower purchase prices compared to a big apartment. It is your exit strategy too. Down the road, when you go to sell, if you sell an apartment, well, you're more at the mercy of the market because you can only sell your apartment to another investor and the numbers need to make sense for that next buyer at that time. But with single family homes and even up to fourplexes sometimes, with your exit, you still have the option to sell to an investor or sell to a homeowner or sometimes you can even sell your property down the road to your tenant that lives there at the time. It's your multiple exit strategies that help create this appeal. You're beginning with the end in mind, like you should. These homes are built by investors for investors from day one and all new construction really in about four geographic areas, depending on how you slice it. Northeast Florida, like Jacksonville and Palm Coast. North Central Florida, that includes Marion and Citrus Counties. Southwest Florida, that includes Cape Coral, and greater Atlanta, Georgia as well. Such population growth and a big variety of employment in those places. This is really one of those more actionable shows that you can sink your teeth into and get a few affordable properties in your portfolio. You can get started at getricheducation.com slash southeast. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.